And even if you identify the solution, the proper solution for that, the simply simple reality of the situation is it will take time. It will not be solved basically overnight in one year, in two, probably not even in five. It, 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 social changes take time, really long time. Uh, basically, you are building future for your kids, to be honest, not for yourself. Right. And I agree with them about root causes. They're not wrong. Poverty is the cause. That's why this happens all over the world. In poverty stricken yes. places, there's more crime. No question. But they're so obsessed with trying to figure out how to blame it on white people that they're not being honest with themselves about what's really going on. And that's actually how Rob and I became friends because we were on Facebook in a group and there were these white people telling me to shut up because I'm not allowed to talk about racial issues. And he is a black man came in the dirt said, no, you shut up. <laughs> it's like, you don't know what you're talking about. I believe him when he says he's from the streets because he just said exactly what I deal with on a day to day basis. You know, and because that that's a, you know, you're told you're basically not allowed to discuss this issue unless you check certain boxes. And therefore, if you say something that's correct, then they could tell you it's your privilege talking rather than actually address your argument. It's a very convenient box to fit people in. Well, and, and the other thing is that that infuriates me about this is elevating some of the worst elements in your neighborhood to exalted status for sake of political argument and completely ignoring the people in your neighborhood that, you know, don't engage in these kind of things. Let me, as an example, you know, you look at... Uh, People like the police will pull through and pull people over looking for warrants and everybody's all up in arms. This is terrible. When they pull people over, um, there's a higher chance that a gunfight's going to break out and we're going to end up with a, a, a black male that's getting shot to death. But the reason why the police are going through and pulling these people over for warrants is they're trying to remove a criminal element from the streets so that the good people that live in those neighborhoods can can have some freedom. Uh, and so you have like a, an elderly black couple who can't even walk to the store because of all of the criminal element running around, making things really dangerous. Uh, who's sticking up for them? Right. Well, those people don't exist. <laughs> well, that's, you know, um, uh, there's a guy named Derek Jensen. Um, I think I would describe him as, as an anarcho-primitivist. He's actually going to be on my show pretty soon. But he described that violence down the perceived social scale seems to be invisible. Um, violence up the social scale is perceived to be this huge uproar. And that's the reason why, for example, if you discuss with leftists who are really absorbed into this stuff, any kind of um, violence against a white person it's invisible to them. But any kind of violence against somebody in their group, you know, their hierarchy, is perceived as this huge upheaval. And if you bring it up otherwise, you're just trying to distract from the point or whatever, as if that person's suffering isn't valid because they're not high enough in the hierarchy. You already you see this in foreign policy. You know, um, A country could get bombed once, and then it's acceptable for you to show up and kill hundreds of thousands of their people as long as you're higher up on the social scale. You know, um, I don't want to offend any listeners, so I won't get too far into that. But the point is, it's just to say, imagine in your life how often you've seen, say, a powerful country able to push around an unpowerful country and nobody talks about it. Whereas opposed to that, if it goes in the other direction, that's all anybody wants to talk about. You know, and that's that's the problem is that they're trying to create a new hierarchy whether it's the extreme feminists, the extreme racists, and I'm just calling them extreme racists because that's what it amounts to. They, they, don't, they don't want equality. That's not what this is about. They, they want retribution. They want revenge for things done by people who are not even here, done to other people who are not even here, meaning they're dead hundreds of years ago. And it makes you feel good to, to talk about that, like to feel justified in your rage. There's this old video of John Cleese on extremism. And he goes down the list. He's like, the great thing about extremism is you could be a complete, you know, absolute you know, piece of garbage to everybody and be really mean to them. And it makes you feel good because the only way you're acting, the reason you're acting that way is because they're all just very terrible persons. And so therefore you could go and be a bully and be nasty to people and 
and feel good about yourself because after all, you know, they deserve it. You know, and he points out that the right and left both do this. I'm not doing a very good job of articulating it, but it, everything he said was still relevant today. I, I call them outrage addicts. They got to find something to be mad about. And if there isn't it, that's why I also I use witch hunts as another example. When I said it's like a religion, if because the witch hunters would go to the next village and if they don't see the devil, it just means they haven't looked hard enough yet. It doesn't mean that the devil isn't there. That's how people who are caught up in that kind of mentality operate. And that's what you see when you when you read a blog, because maybe nobody's been shot recently. We're going to read a blog about a Godzilla movie and about why it's racist and sexist and misogynistic. And, you know, we have to protect people from the Godzilla movie. That actually happened, by the way. Somebody wrote an article no, saying that Godzilla is racist. Yes. You know, um, and I, I could give you an example of that just to explain ex oh, you know, temper. But This is how it worked. And fortunately enough, a lot of people of color that were in this Godzilla Facebook group acknowledged that this was the dumbest thing they had ever read. But basically they said, so there's a scene where Ken Watanabe's character, the Japanese professor, is trying to tell a white male general, don't use a nuclear weapon, it's not going to work, it's a bad idea, and the guy didn't listen. So the person analyzing the article, trying to find the devil, because they just haven't looked hard enough yet, said, well, you see, this demonstrates white supremacy. And, you know, the, the white general was just showing, you know, his white supremacy. And I said, you interpreted it that way. The way I interpreted it is that guy was an idiot. And the Japanese general was a genius. Or not general, but scientist. You know, but you're looking for how is this proof, you know, some kind of nefarious thing. You know, and of course, there's always the quotas of maybe there weren't enough women in the film or whatever. You know, but... It, thankfully enough, people of color in the in the comments were like, this is ridiculous. Godzilla is about giant monsters killing each other. You know, but she was looking for a reason to make it racist. So she said, well, you know, there was an interaction with a, with a white male and a Japanese male, and the white male didn't do what the Japanese male said. And I'm like, yeah, and he was wrong and looked really freaking stupid. <laughs> what, what message did you think was supposed to come out of that scene? If I may, uh, just um, basically the... Um what you just said about the Godzilla movie and stuff like that, when you actively looking for something that will then taint your mind and we are literally taught how to eliminate uh, this in, in high schools and stuff like that, when we have science classes where we, we, we are, for example, need to write a paper or something like that and they literally teach us how to think properly if you would basically eliminate biases you know like uh, uh, don't right. look for stuff basically look look at something see what you will find write it down but don't try to look for something somewhere never do that because that then interpret uh, quite a lot into uh for example police shootings when you're looking at it all the time as a racist thing every single police shooting will be to you racist if i may give you a suggestion to whoever is listening uh, I would first look at it before that. Actively tell yourself, look for anything else, ask yourself if it's justified or unjustified, go through many steps, etc. And if you still can't find be can't find justification, then maybe consider racism. But that should be basically one of the last last steps, then like if you would. Well they would argue that no, it should be the first. And yeah. the fact and that you not and the, and the fact that every you time. it should be first shows how racist you are. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I tell you where this thing sort of jumped the shark was the whole Micaiah Bryant deal. That was yep. one. Oh, I looked at that and I said, Jesus not even Christ. they, could, not oh, even they could. Them could look at this one. Right. And they completely proved me wrong. Uh, they, they could absolutely twist that into a racial deal. And I, and I thought, yeah, I thought that Black Lives Matter had maybe jumped the shark on that one, but are they still going strong on it? And um, it also goes to show you just how uh, blinded they can be when watching video footage and, they, and they're describing what they see and you're looking at thinking, wait, what? No, she was clearly defending herself. What? <laughs> um, is there some, are, are the pixels looking different on your end than seeing me, than what I'm seeing here? I don't, I don't know if they're lying to themselves. I don't know if they're legally blind. I, there, there has to be some explanation for this because they're looking at an event. And and I've had people telling me that, well, it was Kyle Rittenhouse that was chasing Joseph Rosenbaum. Uh, no, yep. I, I did no. a video about that too. Anthony Huber's father 
testified to that in court. I'm like, what? You know, so I did a video of that. I, I put all of him talking in court, and then I paired it up with everything that happened. And I said, it would seem that your assessment of what took place is not accurate because Kyle was running the whole damn time, and people were hitting him. This girl was chasing people down and trying to stab them to death. And, you know, yeah. the girl in, in question had a little dog in her hand. Yeah, she was yeah. obviously a threat. And nobody wants to talk about the girl's father, meaning the, the girl who got shot's father, stomping one of the kids in oh the my head. God, yeah. I was like, yeah. the, the mental gymnastics that we're talking about here go beyond the norm, like to, to the point where it's like you've, you've gone beyond the pale. You know, and there are people with, a, with a, uh, an audience trying to say, that somehow this should have gone a different way. But that's that also comes back to my witch hunt analogy. Like one of the things that they would do to test a witch is um, if they suspect you of being a witch, we're going to tie your hands and your legs behind your back, and we're going to throw you in a body of water. Mm -hmm. And if you float, you're a witch, so we're going to have to kill you. But <laughs> if you sink and you die, at least your soul is with God. Now... The reason I bring this up is that that cop was in that situation. There's no right answer to this as far as the left is concerned on this circumstance. Because if he had a shot her, then he's evil. If he had let her kill her, then he's evil. Then it would have been about how he didn't act. You know, like there was no right answer. And they set it up that way all the time. Like, you know, we talked about this earlier. It's like when you discuss with these people the truth about Kyle Rittenhouse, the only answer the only thing they would have been satisfied with was if kyle rittenhouse ended up just like that guy that marquis love kicked in the head in portland a few weeks before the rittenhouse shooting or the guy who just got beaten you know, again i don't know if he died i just did a video about this today in minneapolis yesterday there's video of two black men beating this poor white guy into the ground and there's a puddle of blood behind his head that's what kyle rittenhouse would have ended up like but they would not that's the funny thing is they wouldn't have cheered for it publicly they'd have covered it up and if you brought it up that this white guy got stomped to death at a, at a protest then you're a racist you know they they that's what the only objective that they would have been that was i'm sorry not the objective the only uh result that they would have been satisfied with in all of these instances you know um is that somehow you know the the person who has right-wing conservative beliefs especially if they're ca caucasian straight cisgendered you know, just go down the list and the more they want you dead, you know, that's the only way that they would have been satisfied. There was no solution in the situation short of that. Even if the guy who attacked him first was a child rapist, even if the guy who attacked him the second time was a domestic abuser, strange bedfellows. That's a problem the left has right now. I'm actually going to do a whole series as a leftist on strange bedfellows. Like the fact that feminists are hanging out with Muslims, which mind you, there are great Muslims oh out my, there, yeah. but there are also some really bad Muslims and holy yeah. crap, or yeah. feminists hanging out with people in the hip-hop culture, that's the most misogynistic version of music I've ever heard in my life. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> hip-hop artists hate women, or they refer to them as, you know, this, or they're trophies. <laughs> I mean, like, it's literally worse than any rock music song that I've ever heard. And don't get me wrong, rock music especially used to be really raunchy about women, but at least they were objects that they were desiring. When you listen to a hip-hop music about women, there, you know, it's always antagonistic. How strange bedfellows? How do you how do you do that? How do you resolve that? Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, if I just made, um, I think that that uh, we mentioned it quite a few times already. The tribalism and basically the belonging to the group here plays a big role because here I I, I would ask the audience to trust me to a degree, but so far I asked uh, 83 people here in Europe, you know, and some friends in Zambia, in Africa, and some, you know, like from neighbors, uh, their family from Vietnam, because we have a big uh, Vietnamese di diaspora in Czech Republic. Basically, hey, look at this raw footage of Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, like of the shooting, and tell me if it was, a, you know, for example, murder, or if it was self-defense. And literally, people who are anti-gun, who literally cannot stand guns, where every single one of them, well, holy shit, that's a self-defense. How can anyone think anything else? Every right. single one. And the one basically metric that here is a different is that there is no hate towards Kyle and his like, for example, on political you know, like spectrum. For example, that he is a Trump supporter or something like that. It, 
okay, yeah, so like that's not non factor for us. So we can to a degree look at it, you know, like ob objectively in my opinion, and it should speak volumes that every single person says that's self defense. No, there's a lot of funny stuff like that that where it, it, the, it changes when you get side out, outside of the country. Like I have a friend mm -hmm. who moved his family to Dominica and he's the only white guy he knows on the whole island. I mean, and he knows that there are other ones that live there, but they're all very nice to him and they think everything going on over here is ridiculous. And that's a majority black country. You know, they 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 took in his like his family, they treat him like he's one of them. You know, and <laughs> kind of unrelated, but when you talk about cultural appropriation, this just popped into my head was like this guy was dealing with Africans and he was wearing some African socks. And he was worried that the African people he was going to be talking to would be upset. And the, one of the Africans went, oh, you must be from the United States. We, we don't care about that. We don't care about that over here. Where are the socks? Out, you know, I always put out if it's cultural appropriation. Go to like New Guinea and you encounter those primitive tribes that you have very little contact with, with, with other people. But they're where – whoops, sorry. I would recommend you a fan basically to rotate yeah, or like should. to trigger that, you know, like. <laughs> but, but yeah, go into like New Guinea and, and check it out. They'll come out wearing t-shirts. Well, that's a United States Navy uh, invention. Right. What difference does it make? Right. Um, yeah, I, I just, that whole cultural appropriation. Well, just absolutely think in, in the whole United States, if cultural appropriation is really, you know, like an issue, and not a single American who is not of Czech heritage should drink pills and beer. Just saying. Uh, not no. okay with that, you know, like whatsoever. No, that's bullshit. They're like, I'm glad that you drink it, you know. And well, even better if you actually know where it comes from or like what its history that it was actually failed experiment, you know, like the most popular type of beer, you know, that was actually failed experiment, you know, like it was not supposed to be like that. It was a happy accident, you know what I mean? But hey, if that logic would be true, you could, no, no nobody except, you know, like Czechs could drink that, you know, it's like bullshit logic. Mm -hmm. well, right. it's, well, we think of it as like, flattering you know like i'm exactly. irish do i get upset that people of color celebrate saint patrick's day no i don't care about that at all go for it you know <laughs> what's wrong with that you know is that are polish people going to tell people not to make polish sausage you know but it, if you're again if you're if you're on a witch hunt and you need evidence of the devil then you got to create some pretty crazy criteria for identification of the devil man this guy's pretty squeaky clean you know i mean he employs black people and pays them really well you know, maybe he's even married to a black person, but but he's wearing dreadlocks. Oh, racist. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. One you of know. the worst cases, I, or I should say one of the more hypocritical ones, was the poor food truck. These two girls went to Mexico and learned a recipe for making a burrito. So they set up a food truck in, I think yep. it was Seattle, Port Portland or Seattle, one of the two. And they um, basically boycotted. They set up like a like almost like a strike perimeter around it to prevent people from being able to go in and buy any burritos from these two girls and they finally had to close their restaurant the hypocritical side is is they're probably the biggest cinco de mayo celebrators on the planet right you no know, it's like wait you're you're buying beer to go and celebrate a battle that did not involve america at all and how is that not cultural appropriation by the way my uh, my friend who was uh you know, my best friend when I was younger, he was from Mexico. And he said, Cinco de Mayo is not a big deal in Mexico. I don't understand why Americans make such a big, big thing out of it. Well, right. I can tell you why. It's beer sales. You right. know, it's, it's uh, greeting card businesses and everything like that. That's well, yeah. why we celebrate it. It's 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 a uh, commerce. Like Sweetest Day. Sweetest Day didn't exist until Harmark created it. <laughs> like mm -hmm. Hallmark, the card company, created Sweetest Day to make more money because Valentine's Day wasn't enough. <laughs> yeah. By the uh, oh, go ahead, Paul. I'm sorry. Yeah, just Johnny, you know, like with the basically with the stand and stuff like that, uh, uh, like police w would not help them. In 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 was that you know like just because it's a specific city with a sort of specific policy where politics go into politi uh, policing or because uh, I'm like, are you for real? Like, what the fuck is that? I, don't know. I I think police and this was again. I think it was either Portland or Seattle. I think the police are like. No, we don't want to get involved in this. This is a civil deal. And so well, they just basically let them. I don't think they were ganging up outside to prevent people from going in. It was like a a, a bad PR campaign. They canceled them, basically. Okay. 
you know, at least that's my understanding of it. But that's no, it, it was a it was an actual truck, so it wasn't mm -hmm. uh, an actual business. And they had set up like a perimeter, sure. uh, like, and I don't think that if I would have walked up, I would have probably pushed my way through and just got my burritos. Yeah, you know, I don't think they would have necessarily stopped me. Although nowadays, who knows? Mm. But but a lot of people just don't have that kind of like you know, impetus to, to break through that. Um, they don't want to be cast as somebody who doesn't take this cultural appropriation thing very seriously and all that. And so they basically just starved them out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that's unfortunate. I'm, I'm sure that they saved a lot of Mexicans from, from being hurt by that. Cause that's probably, Oh my God. But, you, you know, know. <laughs> Mexicans were, were involved. Go? I know, I know I was being sarcastic. No, go ahead. but go ahead, they, they, they do precisely go because they, they, they claim they are doing something in name of, for example, a certain, you know, like a minority. They invest shit tons of time into canceling someone and they then claim they're helping people. Don't you think it would be more beneficial to actually invest the time into actually helping them people, even going to work and then donating them the pay? That would be far better, you know, like option than it, it, what the fuck were you doing, you know? Literally, that 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 that, that, that stifles the economical uh, growth, you know, like of, for example, the locality. But you know, like also think of this: if they're making, you know, like pretty kick-ass burrito or something like that, you buy the burrito, you know, like hey, that's pretty good burrito. I would like to know no more. I will go, for example, to Mexico or something like that. I will invest my money more supporting that, you know, like. Uh, minority or you know you know what i mean the people of that you know like racial background it's just so contraproductive so illogical it just oh my god it's a waste yeah. of time and energy and it's not protecting yeah. anybody from anything by the That's, way i've been accused of it you've this been was, accused of cultural appropriation yeah my last name uh the walker dread oh really but it's a playoff johnny walker red right but i'm a reggae dj i mean <laughs> the dish since the early 80s. That's awesome. And so, and you know what? And yeah, I don't wear dreadlocks. I don't wear a tam. Oh my God. I don't, do, I, don't, I don't do it because you don't have to do that to really enjoy the music and play it for others. But yeah, I, I mean, I have street cred when it comes to the whole reggae scene, and yet I'm not supposed to use the word tread. And, I, who, and who's telling me? Is it somebody from Jamaica? No, it's just probably some white college student telling me that you know uh, what i'm doing is wrong well I'll tell you what if if jamaicans if the if, if we have jamaican music lovers want to complain they can complain i'm not gonna listen to them but i don't want to hear it from you you know that kind thing of is is most of the jamaicans i've met are extremely nice people mm -hmm. and probably would just be hey man that's pretty cool you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a, it, you know. <laughs> it's a different culture. Like, that's for sure. Like, there was this girl I knew in high school who, you know, like she was so sweet and nice and she was Jamaican. She had been like the nicest person I've ever met in my life. Like, you could hand her, you know, anything and she'd be like, thank you. It wouldn't have mattered what it was. She was so awesome. But regardless, you know, um, I think, uh, you know, so now with the Rittenhouse stuff, obviously we're looking at, going to trial um and things are kind of hush hush i guess um as far as they to like be. yeah um yeah. I, i'm that's hoping they are they going to broadcast it that's what i'm wondering i think that we have a couple of cases that are coming up before then that's going to dominate how this kyle rittenhouse thing unfolds and i've mentioned them on uh numerous occasions and paul and i have talked about them uh the crystal kaiser thing is really starting to heat up now and now that the the appellate court has responded now that can go to trial and it's probably going to proceed here over the next few months and if she's convicted holy cow the everybody is going to turn on the kyle rittenhouse thing and say we want him convicted we don't care if he's innocent we need him convicted because it's only fair you know i feel terrible that i've forgotten the man's name but there was another guy he had long hair and a ponytail, and I want to say he lived in Seattle, and he was running a bar. And during the um, riots, he was defending his property, and a group of black guys jumped on him. One of them was choking him, and he shot two of them. And they originally cleared him, and I feel so bad for forgetting his name. 
Yeah. Um, and then they went ahead and charged him, and then he committed suicide. Yeah, and I know exactly which one you're talking about. I, Robert Barnes has talked about him quite a bit on his. Uh, that YouTube. video is so obvious what happened there, and that poor guy knew he was going to get pulled through the ringer, and he took his own life. It makes me really angry because, like, I knew it was going to happen. Like, because again, I, I grew up in those neighborhoods, so I know that there's a body language that's happening when they're getting ready to set you up to jump on you. And it, it's reminiscent of like, you know, what predators do when they're getting ready to jump on something. And I was like, oh, dude, they're about right. Yep, there it is. One of them just ran up behind him. Yep. Oh, look at that. Yep. Now they're yeah. taking him well, down. We've seen that before. Yep. I was yep. like, yeah. oh, you know, and again, they were angry with that. He didn't get convicted. But what, you know, what would they have been satisfied with if he was lying in a pool of his own blood stomped out? That would have been the only way that they would have been okay with what went on, you know, and that's, you know, I, I that's the other thing is like, we've kind of come to a point that I recognize this is that the only way that it's acceptable ever at this point to shoot a person of color is if, well, actually, I don't think they, it's like, I want to know what the criteria is. How much of a body count do they have to rack up before the police officers are allowed to shoot them? Do they have to kill two people, three people? You know, like, because they're, they're never satisfied. And, you know, that's the part that is so irrational when you try to discuss it with them. And I think that the reason that Rob's perspective was different is that he lost family members that were close to him. And, you know, and he lost them at the hands of the criminal, you know, system that exists in those those communities. A lot of these people don't know what that's like. And if they, all they've ever watched is videos that are handpicked to make the cops look as bad as possible, you know, that's actually one of the reasons why I think that they were so desperate. So like when the Jacob Blake thing come out, we go back to Kenosha, we see one video, there's two videos that exist, but rather strategically, we don't get to see both of them. You know, they release the first one and it causes the outrage that they want. And then that's all they want to talk about. When the second video comes out, by that point, it's too late. We're already burning Kenosha down. We're already rioting all over the country. And they needed a martyr. And the stuff that they invented about Jacob Blake, like um, I did a video on my channel with like a bait and switch where it was man rapes woman and then returns to steal her car and abduct her kids. And you go into the video going, man, that sounds pretty terrible. And then I reveal, yeah, I'm talking about Jacob Blake, by the way, you know, <laughs> violated a restraining order that his rape victim got against him. This is the guy who got shot in the back seven times. And that may be excessive. But he was also getting in a car and taking off with someone else's children. And I'm thinking to myself in my head, if my daughter had a boyfriend that raped her and then showed up to take her car and take off with her kids and the cops shot him, I, I don't think I'd lose too much sleep about that. Go um, ahead. If I may just, uh, that is a big play also uh, in, in all of this is that uh, general public is simply clueless about be it use of force or violence. And I just want to say uh, with the Jacob Blake, uh, I spoke with a buddy, I met him uh, at a wedding uh, just last week uh, about Jacob Blake shooting. And he told me that he would uh, in that situation, even if Jacob Blake would not be at that moment armed, which he was absolutely even by his own admission, uh, he would have shot him too, uh, even in the back, because they were specifically told that uh, this situation, basically because uh, Jacob Blake was uh, uh, both convicted criminal or uh, just accused, uh, I'm not sure. He now, had an active had... warrant for yeah. rape. Yeah, okay. <laughs> at the time. And F fair enough, but uh, yeah. basically his life is going to take a dive that, that is basically given. And he was stepping into a car with two children, his children. And what quite often happens in these situations is basically murder-suicide, where the dad or whatever, you know what I mean, the mother, yeah, it doesn't matter, where basically they perceive, hey, people are going to take my kids away. It's better if we end this life together and they drive, for example, under wheels of a semi. And I must say, uh, he, or he told me that uh, basically he would then perceive it and not sure to a degree he would be probably right that the blood of the children would be then on his hands as well. 
So that's to what a degree, how basically complicated the, the policing of a society is that I honestly haven't thought of that. And I'm pretty versed in be it use of force or, or violence, but I haven't thought of this scenario before. Yeah, I went over that in one of my videos where I went through the Tennessee versus Garner uh, deal. The, somewhere along the line, we're going to have to teach these kids that um, have you committed a felony? Are you armed? Are you trying to escape? They can shoot you. Better figure that out. They're not. And ultimately, uh, they're engaging in these kind of behaviors and they think somehow that they're going to come out on top. Well, you don't, you may be. Maybe you have a good argument, but you're dead. The best thing to do is to understand what the law says you can and cannot do. And they don't think that. They they think that, well, you know, I was I was just trying to get away from the scene. Yeah, but you had a gun and you had just taken a shot at somebody. They can absolutely unload on you. And they're not understanding that. Well, and they, they don't think about how they would survive that incident. Have you ever watched the video of like people going through the police training and going, oh, mm -hmm. this, this is a lot different than I thought? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. had one up in, I think it was in uh, near the Tulsa area. I think it was at Bartlesville or something like that, where they had a reporter um, who picked up a gun and they had the reporter going through a car lot looking for a suspect. And afterwards, they said, you'd be dead, by the way. You really made some serious mistakes there. And the reporter afterwards said, I didn't realize it was this difficult. Right. Yeah. And there was a guy that was an activist. He was a pastor who was marching with Black Lives Matter. And he went through it. You can watch the video on YouTube. And in one of the instances, he shot somebody who shouldn't have been shot. And in the other instance, he got killed. Um, and since then, that pastor has been asking other pastors of color to go through this training so that they could talk to their congregation about the truth of the matter, because a lot of people have no idea what it's like to try to do that job. Um, by the way, for the sake of the people listening, the gentleman that I mentioned earlier um, was from Omaha, Nebraska, and his name was Jake Gardner. And he killed somebody named James Skurlock. And this was during um, a riot taking place um, in the wake of George Floyd. Um, unfortunately, this matter got completely buried. And now that the guy is um, like he they exonerated him of charges and Black Lives Matter pushed the issue till eventually the prosecutor went ahead and charged him anyway. Um, you know, and it was clear self-defense. But anyway, I just want to make sure people who, you know, who would have wanted to know more could look it up because that was a tragedy. Right. And it wasn't the same one I was thinking of. There was another case where a man just simply brandished a gun to get the people to quit chasing him. And um, his mistake was he went for a, a bench trial, so not a jury. And the and if he would have gone for a jury trial, he might have had a better chance. But he got a, a number of years for that. And in reality, uh, he didn't shoot anybody. They were out to actually kill him. He pulled his gun out to let them know, hey, I am armed. Leave me the F alone. Right. And, are you familiar with this case I'm talking about? No, I but continue. Well, I think that's that's pretty much it. And and again, got got totally railroaded by a uh, a, a judge. And I think this was Portland. I'm going to have to look that up. But that was the one that was Robert Barnes was talking about. Right. And it's unfortunate we don't know these guys' names off the top of our head, right? I mean, right. Well, yeah, and, and because it just got buried. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. wasn't sexy enough because he was clearly in the right. And it, it addressed the, you know, the, the criminal gang attitude that I'm talking about that creates the kinds of criminals who do these things. And again, it's not racial. It just by, you know, it, it happens in all communities all over the world where there are poor people, you know, but it, it does happen in this country. Statistically, the FBI statistics show it a lot. And it's true that there are a lot of black people in poverty. Nobody is insinuating that this is genetic or that this is a trait inherent in people of color, it's a cultural issue. And it, you know um, that, that the, nobody wants to address that part of it. It's easier to blame it on other people than to take any responsibility for how, you know, what part you could take, you know, play in fixing the problem. The guy's name is Michael Strickland. So viewers out there, if you want to look at a, at a perfect example of how distorted uh, self-defense has become in the eyes of some of these courts. Michael Strickland, 
And a lot of people said, well, why doesn't Kyle just go for a bench trial? You know, and I'm thinking, no, don't make the mistake that uh, Michael Strickland did. Although I, I think that Judge Schroeder is far more uh, uh, fair than the judge in Portland. You know, um, I had a critic of my Kyle video who uh, his channel is called The Non-Lawyer. And, you know, we debated back and forth on the issue of shooting an unarmed man. And to the guy's credit, he found a article and I'm going to look for it to try to find the guy's name while we're talking, but of a black man who had to defend himself with his firearm because a gang of people were approaching him, like intent on doing him harm, and he knows what comes next if you end up on the ground. And so he shot one of them, and he got off. Like, they, they exonerated him. And that was reported by The Root, like which is a very Black Lives Matter-friendly thing, um, you know, um, outlet. You know, and he's like, this changed my mind. He's like, I hadn't thought about it like that. I'm like, well, <laughs> thank you for being honest. It was really big of him to come forward and say that. And he shared the link with me because it became relevant in one of my shows later. But because they all keep saying this thing of, well, if Kyle Rittenhouse was black, he would have been shot on the spot. And I'm like, that's not necessarily the truth. <laughs> I'm like, if you show up with your hands up like that and walk towards them and turn yourself in, you got a much higher likelihood of survival no matter what color you are. And this guy proves it because he went through the system. He defended himself with self-defense. He shot an unarmed man and he's walking free now. Yeah, the counter examples to these arguments are so easy to find. Um, Corey Al Muhammad, uh, he was, uh, I think it was in Fresno, California, uh, shot three white people because they were white. I mean, he said it. Right. And the police, surrounded him and they took him in alive he ran out of bullets he was shooting at the police and just ran out of ammo and they took him in alive dylan noble white kid wasn't armed at all shot to death by the same police force and by the way that is a very disturbing video if you want to see it because uh, dylan's laying on the ground face down and the police officer fires a, a 12 gauge into him well i I'm going to give the police some benefit of the doubt here. They, the police officer must have saw something that thought that gave him the idea that he was a threat. But, you know, this idea somehow that this only happens to a certain race is ridiculous. A perfectly good example is in Houston, where they had, um, it was uh, Regina Nichols, I believe was her name, or something like, and Dennis Tuttle. They were sitting in their home, minding their own business. Police barged in on a no knock warrant shot both of them, killed the dog too. And guess what? The no-knock warrant was a result of a faked informant. The police officer that was in charge created a fake informant so he could get a warrant so that they could bust into that house and they end up killing both of them people. And guess what? About a year later, Breonna Taylor happens and everybody thinks this only happens to black people. Right. Those two people in Houston were both white. If well, I may, uh, go ahead. Just quickly, uh, with the basically that unarmed person is not a threat. I literally made a video a few, few weeks ago, you know, like specifically on that. It turned out pretty good, you know. So, I'm gonna plug a wee bit my channel, you know, like on Logical Checkmate. You can check it out, you know, like who's watching. <laughs> and uh, I basically uh, still had people from Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, like the who are let's say anti cows as uh, Johnny, you know, like uh, calls them. Uh, and and they were just making these insane excuses. I, I for example demonstrated one of the dangers of unarmed attacker is that you, if you get knocked out, you fall to the ground, you can crack your skull. And I showed there an example of somebody being jumped from behind, getting knocked out and cracking his skull by fall, literally proving my point. But the person was like, oh no, 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 that person was jumped from behind. Kyle would be jumped from front. And I'm like, what does it matter where someone is jumped from? You know, like you fall to the ground to crack your skull, you dead basically. And right. and, and and just it was such insanity, and I I absolutely don't understand to what basically a degree of cognitive dissonance you need to go, how far you need to lie to yourself, where you are like, yeah, hey, maybe. I made a mistake. Maybe, you know, like I could think something else. Maybe I should look into it more. 
it's, it's not at the very least, just shut up. <laughs> right? well, look, okay, look, if you, if you don't want to acknowledge the truth, at least be quiet. <laughs> no, it's, it, it, well, especially true. when you consider the fact that Kyle didn't even turn around to fire his weapon until Zeminski fired his. Yeah. You know, and, and until then, he was just trying to get the hell out of there. And I'm fairly confident that if Zeminski had not fired his shot, Kyle would have ran around behind that car and would have just tried to keep going. You know, who knows if if Rosenbaum would have caught him. But, you know, um, one of the things uh, that I exposed in my video, um, and I was using another uh, lady's video, unfortunately, she took hers down, but she pointed out the the behavior of Zeminski and his wife was casual, like they were walking to the store to buy a sandwich. And this is after long, they... Right? Yeah, so yeah. yeah. After yeah. they fired the gun in the air, they're just walking along, you know, no big deal. You know, like, meanwhile, everybody else is running and screaming and dodging and, you know, trying to get the hell out of the way. That guy walked, like, right past the car source, and then he doesn't do anything of any interest until he turns around and starts screaming, get him! Get him! Yeah. He shot him! You know, like, <laughs> it's like, oh... Anyway, so he well, you didn't interview him, but you had a discussion with this dude. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, have... he, he commented on my video, and he and I went back and forth a little bit. Did he ever mention anything about why he was so nonchalant? No, um, but, I mean, part of the thing that's funny is, like, our connection is that the prosecuting attorney apparently viewed my video, which is what led to Zeminski getting um, arrested. <laughs> <laughs> which is reported by the Milwaukee Sentinel and a few other outlets, because the, he's the guy that nobody wants to talk about. The funny thing is, if you discuss reckless endangerment, that's exactly what he did. He used his firearm in a manner that was absolutely inappropriate, that led to a bunch of people getting killed. But, you know, the media doesn't even want to talk about him. And mind you, I don't watch the mainstream media very much anymore, but I haven't seen a damn thing about Zeminski on Fox. Haven't seen it on... I mean, Fox is friendly. They may have. I'll, I'll look at it that. But definitely, you're not going to see it on CNBC, CNN. You're not going to see it anywhere else. That there's another guy who fired a pistol who happened to be one of the rioters. Oh, imagine that. Yeah. Could I ask you when, when was the when did you make the video? What was the date? Which one? Because I've the I've made one a bunch that of this. It, the yeah used for uh, identifying Siminski. Um, I did the, the original video on my channel is called the Kyle Rittenhouse incident, a documentary. And I mm -hmm. used, it wasn't, um, I didn't, I didn't monetize it on purpose because it's basically me cutting and pasting together everything to try to create a chronological order. Let me see when I, when I actually did it. Cause it's been a little while. Um, I know it was like around the same time of the incident because one of the things that was driving me crazy was just all the stuff. Okay, so it was eight months ago is what YouTube is telling me that I uploaded sure. this. On September 27, 2020 was when I when I did my yes. final cut. I've beaten you to it because I didn't <laughs> identify him you know, like by name, but uh, basically, my, literally my first video, uh, I don't know if I was the first on, on, on the internet or anything, but uh, it I did my. Uh, I noticed basically the Ziminski was the or the tall person that you could spot, you know, like here and there. That was he was the first shooter and stuff like that. And I made you know like whole video analysis. Uh, oh well, on, yeah, and I'm not taking channel. credit for any. Of that's that's, no, 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 it's just you know like we bit yeah. of a friendly competition, you know, like I made it on the September 10th, you know. <laughs> no, my video was sourced from a bunch of other people's work, and then and my, my 4chan. Yeah. There was a 4chan website. That also kind of quietly sent me a message and said, "Hey, um, okay. I got all this information for you. You might want to use it." <laughs> and I'm like, "Sure." And they're the ones who, uh, 4chan's the one who figured out that he was going under an assumed name, that he was calling okay. himself Alex Blaine, and like it was on the 4chan website. They went, "He's not Alex Blaine. Here he is, right here. His name's Joshua Zeminski." So yeah. 4chan and anonymous, anonymous figured it out, and it's funny because. Those people think that Anonymous is on their side, and some of them might be, and some of them might not. It's another amorphous group. But yeah, it was 4chan that put together that he was a different guy, because he had two Facebook accounts. They're down now, but if you watch my video, I've got screenshots of his um, profiles, because he had two. And the reason he had, he was going by Alex Blaine is because the guy's got a three-page, you know, criminal record, and he couldn't get a job. You know, imagine that. 
it, that's another thing when you talk about the the justice system how the hell is that guy still walking around like after we got him arrested for him being the first shooter they let him out on a thousand dollar bond and when you look at his stuff the prosecutor's been giving him sweet plea bargains for years yeah. going back to 2010 it makes me wonder i'm like you know i don't i mean obviously it's probably not the same da all the way back from 2010 but it makes you wonder what the hell's going on in the kenosha you know um department because this guy should not just be walking around he's got habitual offender like a bajillion times on his record and he just he'll he'll basically plead guilty to half of it you know and then they'll they'll get rid of the other half it's like the da's just trying to get him out of there you know, but imagine if he hadn't been there, you know, this may be a very different situation. Well, they did it again. Yeah. These, these charges that they had with for him opening uh, up with the firearm. Um, I don't know if you followed it, but yeah, they've got him now for a felony arson, but nothing related to the Kyle Rittenhouse shooting. Yeah, yeah. So they've dropped all that stuff. So he's uh, now he's he could be facing some serious time for the arson thing. Frankly, I doubt it. I think we lost one of our co-hosts here. Yeah, I think that uh, he'll ch he'll check back in. I'm sure, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's and, and also with Gage Grosscrooks, mm -hmm. he had felony robbery. He dismissed right. the charges, and and you watch this stuff, you think, why am I so worried about getting arrested for anything? <laughs> I'm not, but <laughs> right, it's like, yeah, I was really surprised at how so often people get arrested and nothing right it comes right. out you know unfortunately for gage that probably cost him his arm <laughs> right right yeah yeah you know and that's yeah. oh so, man talking about another example of the media totally ruining something they they published that picture of gage with his hands up and said that kyle was shooting him even though he was surrendering that was their version of it yeah. And you know, the reality is, is he fake surrendered and then pointed his gun at him anyway. And that's when Kyle discharged his rifle. I'm like, I'd have shot you too. <laughs> One of the things that comes out about this uh, whole deal is how the, the role that the independent small time YouTubers and such are driving the actual real evidence. Right. Whereas the media is nowhere to be found. Right. They, um, the Washington Post did a reasonable job of uncovering some things and they had a pretty for for the post relatively unbiased i guess right I mean, you, you could sense that they were sugarcoating some things but that washington post documentary was the first i ever heard that hey this joseph, joseph rosenbaum is a real jackass oh right God. you know and his girlfriend and she's talking about she's acknowledging at least the problems but after you watch that you think Joe's a Rosa bomb. This guy was out of control. And what I'm kind of surprised is that people that in the Washington Post, its viewership is watching this and they're not coming away with the idea that, you know, Joseph Rosenbaum was, was a real animal. And right. they're still looking upon him as this, you know, sacrificial victim that was right. minding his own business. He was just there protesting and and Kyle came up and shot him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Chased so, him down the street, according to down the street, according, according to Huber's dad. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. Um, the, the, I want to kind of circle back on the Crystal Kaiser thing because mm -hmm. um, the right now they're already mangling the news about her appeal, and yeah. so they're still you still hear them talk about her being. Uh, fighting you know, self-defense claim here. She's she's claiming self-defense. She's not claiming self-defense, but there's, they're going to be painting it. And so if she's convicted, despite her very strong self-defense claims, what do you think they're gonna to do to Kyle? But It'll definitely be a, a court of public opinion. Um, and that's unfortunate because yeah. there are people that are being swayed, you know, based on the threat of riots. I mean, um, we see that, like, the guys who dragged Reginald Denny out of his truck and basically tried to kill him, um, they eventually did get, you know, they did get prison sentences, but they were pretty damn light for what happened. And it's because people are worried about another riot. That's what I call the rioter's veto. And I'm worried that if it continues, 
you know, like that's why, you know, I just did that video today about the about the guy who got beat up and then the shooting when the, apparently it looks like the guy literally pulled his gun on two federal marshals. I'm like, yeah, good job. So, of course, you got shot. Now, mind you, I say apparently because the details are still coming out. And unfortunately, we don't have any cameras. You know, um, I actually do think that body cameras should just be mandatory for anybody, period. Not just for the perspective of protecting the suspect, but for protecting the officer. Because, like, I had to, I did a video on um, Michael Reinhold, the Antifa member who murdered a member of Patriot Prayer, Jay Danielson. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any video of what the cops did. And the funny thing about how that got reported is I did research and there are two witnesses that say that Michael Reinhold got out of his car and fired on the police. And then there's one witness that Vice grabbed and said, yeah, well, this witness said that they just walked up and shot him, meaning the cops shot Reinhold. And I'm like, OK, it's interesting that you only reported on that one witness's take on it because there are two other witnesses who say that's not what happened. Um, and one of them happened to have been a person of color. And I found a video of that lady talking about what she saw. She's like, you know, it, they, he had it coming. He pulled his gun on them and started shooting. You know, it's like, oh, OK, well, you know, what more do you need? But, you know, if if you talk to the people on the left, then he was murdered. You know, and if you talk to the people on the right, you know, it's like, well, I guess justice was done. You know, whereas for me, it's like I accept that there are going to be leftists who are going to do stuff I don't like as a leftist. <laughs> And most people who are sensible on the right would say the same thing. You know, um, I mean, even like uh, really extreme people like Ben Shapiro, for example, called out Charlottesville for what it was, you know, terrible, you know, bad situation, you know, that shouldn't have happened, you know, but you can't get that same attitude about anything from the other direction right now because the left has worked itself up into this major fervor, um, you know, and it's so liquid hot you know, that the, the rationality just like seeps out of it, you know, um, and it, it's unfortunate because a lot of these things are important to the future of people on both sides of this. And if they don't figure that out, you know, it's like one of the things I guess that makes me weird is that I am a leftist, but I know how to talk to people on the right, like human beings. And that's not allowed. You're not supposed to do that. You know, you're being discouraged to talk to anybody like that, you know, and any group of people that has to protect their ideology by insulating it, by peer pressuring people not to talk to some of the other side, that's a cult. You know, yeah, that, that, exactly. that, that's what deeply religious people do. Like, we don't want you to go to the Jordan Peterson lecture because, well, you shouldn't just you just shouldn't talk to him. He's a he's a fascist and you shouldn't even you know give him a platform is how they justify it. They, what they're really worried about is that Jordan Peterson might say something they agree with, you know, or and can't counter at all. Right. And, you know, have you followed any of the Evergreen State? Oh, uh, my goodness. Oh, I tell oh, everybody they should watch that documentary that Benjamin Boyce did because that's yeah, scary. He, he's excellent. I, I, I followed him and uh, watched all of those updates for probably a good year or so. And that's shocking. That is really shocking. And what I've seen is now is that this has bled out into more mainstream. Well, I think I think it was already happening everywhere and people just weren't talking about it and that the people at Evergreen were stupid enough to record all of it and upload it is what it amounts to. Because like there's videos of that same crap, like what was it, Yale, I think, where they were like these kids, you know, rich, spoiled kids, you know, at Yale University explaining to the headmaster how oppressed they were, you know, and it was the same kind of stuff. You know, I can't remember what the name of the guy was, but the headmaster of Yale was being treated the same way as Brett Weinstein. You know, um, it's what it amounts to is that there is, and this is why I say communist takeover. Um, there was a, a KGB defector named Yuri. I'm not going to be able to pronounce his last name, but he was warning us about this in the 80s. You know, and you can still find the video of him. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Right, describing mm -hmm. uh, ideological subversion. And part of the strategy is to infiltrate the educational systems of the country and to get people, you know, to become professors in that system so that they can start manipulating what, you know, the young are being taught. And, you know, uh, that's the part about it that's legit, you know, and I think. 
the only thing that I take away from that that I feel I need to tell people on the right was one of the other things that Yuri said was, the rich will buy the rope they will be hung with. He said, if you continue to make it so that the poor are desperate, you're begging the communists to show up and get the poor to support them. You know, and what he's talking about is like, if you're so worried about profits that you're making it impossible for people to make an honest living, you know, the communists will show up and exploit that. And that's the other side of it that the people on the right don't tend to look at. Um, there's something that constantly frustrates me is that we put so much emphasis on what the poor are doing and blaming them. Nobody talks about the wealthy CEOs who, for example, you want to talk about, you know, illegal immigrants getting your job. Why doesn't anybody talk about the guy employing them? You know, why doesn't anybody talk about that guy? You know, like um, they're talking about, well, we don't want you to raise the minimum wage. The illegal undocumented workers don't make minimum wage. That's the reason they get hired. But no, and the funny thing is, is the government has the information necessary to prosecute those people. Um, it just doesn't happen. The, the people who employ illegal, you know, immigrants never go to jail and it's illegal. You know, but it's easier to get the people on the right who are poor to fight the people on the left who are poor. And meanwhile, the people at the top just basically laugh all the way to the bank while we're fighting each other. You know, and that's the part about it that that bothers me is that, you know, people are concerned about the price of certain welfare programs. But the bank bailout was like billions of dollars, you know, where they just paid themselves bonuses out of it. You know, and it's like, that should be a huge outrage. And don't get me wrong, the Tea Party called that out. You know, like they definitely went after it. But, you know, again, we're being conditioned to fight each other. They want us going after the fighting off over the scraps that they're throwing off the table. Mm -hmm. And that's what we turn into is like a bunch of rabid dogs that haven't been fed enough that are fighting each other over the scraps that get tossed to them. You know, and I think that if the populists on the right could work with the populists on the left and say, look, there are things that we don't agree on, but there are also things we do agree on. Can we work together? And that will scare the ever living daylights out of the people that are the real problem in this country. And that's why they don't want it to happen. Yeah. That, and that's a good point because it turns out that if you look at your average, um, I don't know, let's say proud boy kind of person. Okay. Right. Whatever that is, you know, and you look at your typical Antifa person, they actually have a common bond there is that they sense that the corporations are, you know, making life difficult for them financially, but they just cannot get past the whole political deal of, you know, race. Well, essentially race, <laughs> right? Right. So, yeah. They, they actually have more in common than they think, but they just don't want to rally behind that because that would mean cooperating with somebody who you think is a political enemy. Well, right. And and they, they can't, they don't speak their language. Like they don't understand them. Like a Tea Party member showed up at Occupy and they sent me to go talk to him because they knew that I could talk to a libertarian Tea Party guy, you know, because I understood his language. I understood his values, you know, so I was like an ambassador. And it was funny that they all knew they did not have the patience to do that, that they did not have the ability to go talk to that person. And I was like, he disagrees with the bank bailout as much as we do. What you know, it's like you really can't talk to him. No, I'm like oh, okay, <laughs> you know, well, who does that work for? It, it benefits the banks that we can't talk to each other. There's another reason why I wanted to bring up the Evergreen State thing was it Evergreen State. Now, I don't know, are you familiar with this, Paul? But um, Evergreen State is this college in Washington where uh -huh. essentially communists and, and Marxists took control. And it is a perfectly good example of how not to react to it. You had a president who thought that he could acquiesce and he learned the hard way that you cannot uh, give in to them because they will never be satisfied with anything you give them. Um, and, I, and I will suggest to you that Fred Weinstein was another one who really thought that if he could just say, look, I'm on your side enough that they'll, they'll see you know, that, hey, he's not a threat to us. Didn't happen. Right. Once they identify you as an enemy, you might as well just be the enemy <laughs> because because you cannot, uh, I think you understand what I'm saying, you cannot paint yourself as a compadre and get in with their uh, 
good feelings. Well, when not we, if you want to have any independent thought or the ability to disagree with them. The right. only role that you can play to them as a white male, straight white male, cis white, is to be totally submissive, nod when they speak, and do exactly what they tell you. If you try to take any other role, then your your privilege is showing. Mm. Like that's why it, the people who come out the other side of that, like it literally looks like they've been brainwashed. 